Hi, this is the second part to a longer video going over the complexity of the 90s era x86 processor front ends. If you have not seen the first part, I would recommend watching that first. While the last video covered the original Pentium, this video will cover the Pentium MMX. First, a recap from part 1. While the original Pentium introduced several advancements in front end x86 architecture related to length decoding, it still had many issues. The first issue was related to the simple approximation for the dual instruction decoding. Since the instruction length for the U decoder can't be guaranteed beforehand, a heuristic approximation must be made, which was assuming that all U instructions were one byte in length. As we saw in the previous part, this was not a good approximation, but was necessary to properly decode prefix bytes. This one byte length approximation was then partially mitigated by using an instruction length cache, which could replace the one byte approximation under a cache hit. Unfortunately, this requires the cache to be primed, meaning that the instruction must have been previously decoded. So the length cache was mostly only useful for loops of code, and likely small loops of code given the probable cache size. The fact that the 0f escape code was treated as a prefix instead of part of the instruction also would lead to issues with MMX. The MMX instruction set extension introduced a set of single instruction multiple data, or SIMD, instructions. These allowed for a significant performance improvement in certain repetitive workloads, and was the precursor to the SSE and later AVX instructions. All of the MMX instructions however begin with the 0F escape code. We saw in the previous part that the P5 could decode one full escaped instruction per cycle with V decoder accumulation. But wouldn't it be better to decode two MMX instructions per cycle? This means that 0F needs to be treated as part of the opcode somehow. There was also an issue with the length mod, 66 and 67 prefix bytes. These ended up being used quite a bit for 16-bit operations in 32-bit mode, or vice versa. However, due to the P5 design, such instructions required at least two cycles to decode. And finally, while not discussed in the previous part, there was an issue regarding U and V pipeline pairability. Essentially, if the instructions in the U and V rotators could not pair, then only one could be decoded in that cycle. This can lead to lower performance if the instructions are not compiled to take advantage of this pairing and can clog up the pipeline. All of these shortcomings were addressed by the Pentium MMX and led to microarchitectural changes that are still present in modern-day Intel processors. Instead of simply presenting the solution, let's do an exploration of possible solutions to better motivate the changes that were introduced in this processor revision. The first question we should ask is, why not just fully compute the lengths? If we did, then the front end would look something like this. It would be possible to implement, but you can probably already see the problem. The critical path would end up being far too long. Not only would it go through two rotators, but it would also need to go through two full-length calculators. It had previously been mentioned that a single-length calculator was expensive and required most of the P5 decode one cycle to compute. Now going through two of them, plus the rotators, would result in twice the propagation delay and cut the clock speed in half. While this does increase the IPC, that improvement will be offset by the drop in clock speed, therefore decreasing the combined instructions per second. So going back to the list of optimization techniques, if approximation doesn't work and guessing doesn't work, what about parallel computation? Perhaps something like this. If we could somehow compute the length of the U instruction in parallel with the length of the V instruction, then we could reduce the critical path. This unfortunately won't work. To understand this, we need to think about the instruction stream in a data structure way as a linked list. Essentially, the decode program counterpoints to an entry in the linked list of instructions, which requires a length evaluation to find the next entry in the list, and so on. This type of structure is well studied and always results in an order and traversal time for the nth entry. As such, it's impossible to traverse faster than order n. Given that n is small in our case however, order n may be feasible if the length evaluation is quick enough. But we have already established that it's not. So then what about splitting up the computation into multiple cycles? Splitting the length calculation might look something like this. This way, we only need to do a single length calculation per cycle, at the exchange of taking more cycles to perform the computation. In other words, making the pipeline deeper. Doing so does have implications for branch delays and penalties. However, there is a bigger problem. The signal path going from the next decode program counter to the current program counter. One option is to connect the next decode PC to the decode PC, which would return to the previous critical path issue. This would essentially shift the critical path around, but still require that an instruction goes through two full-length decoders. Or another option is to register the next decode PC in the decode 2 stage, feeding it back to the decode PC in the following cycle. But this doesn't work either since it requires the signal to travel backward in time as shown with the red arrow, essentially causing a pipeline hazard. The only solution to this problem, other than violating causality, is to introduce pipeline bubbles, which will automatically half the throughput of the pipeline. 
so this method won't work either. But this does impose a useful constraint to try and solve this problem, we need the alignment loop to be tightly coupled and completed in a single cycle. Well, the fastest way to compute something is often to not compute it at all, meaning to look up the answer instead. So what about the final method, pre-computation? So we essentially want something like this. Here, the lengths and offsets are pre-computed in an earlier stage, the fetch stage, and stored into a length lookup buffer. Then the length lookup buffer is accessed with the decode program counter, quickly providing full length information to the rotators in the decode one cycle. But this does beg some obvious questions. Doesn't the length pre-computation still need the decode program counter? And isn't the critical path still too long in the length pre-computer? If so, then all we did was duplicate the U and V rotators, and move the problem forward one cycle. Well, yes, but there is another way to go about doing the computation. Instead of using the decode program counter, or even rotators, you can instead brute force a solution. Instead of computing the relative instructions, you can assume that every byte is the start of an instruction. This is an example of parallel computation, which will result in a lot of wasted effort, hence why I called it brute force. But if you assume that every byte is a possible instruction, then you make the length computation that was previously expensive into a simple buffer lookup. To do this, we are effectively pre-decoding the instructions to extract metadata about them before they enter the decoding stage. We had previously established, however, that doing a full-length decoding is not only expensive with path delay, but also expensive in terms of area. For a 32-byte cache interface, this would be prohibitively expensive in terms of resources. Luckily, we can make a few concessions. The first concession is to make the pre-decoders simpler. A full-length decoder is too expensive so we can use the method of heuristic approximation to speed up the computation. But since we now have a full cycle to perform the computation, we can apply a better heuristic approximation than the one-byte approximation used by the P5. Since it's an approximation, however, we still require full-length decoders in the decode one stage to double-check and correct any incorrect approximations. The worst-case scenario will essentially fall back to the performance of the P5, so this can only improve performance. The second concession is the obvious one, just reduce the cache interface width to reduce the number of required parallel pre-decoders. If the cache width is reduced to 16 bytes instead of 32, then the number required is halved. It should be noted that the actual implementation of these pre-decoders is not known, however, Intel does have several patents published around the time of the Pentium MMX, which describe various methods for doing this. Most of the methods are complicated and overly cryptic, relying heavily on logical evaluation. AMD took a more understandable approach with their K6 processors, also described in a patent, which has its own drawbacks. Given the complexity of the Intel patents and the fact that it's unknown which implementation was used, I can't really do a comparison to say which was more efficient or more accurate. Either way, knowing that the implementation was likely a logic equation-based implementation that relied on precise propagation delay trade-offs is likely sufficient. With that said, you may now be asking, does this solve all of the aforementioned problems with the original Pentium front end? Well, the first two problems with the one byte U instruction approximation and instruction length cache have been solved with the predecoder. The problem with the 0F prefix and the length mod prefix constraint can also be solved partially with the predecoder. In addition to the length of the instruction, the predecoder can also output additional metadata used to quickly respond to specific prefix sequences. For example, if we need to add one to the rotator offset in the case of the 0F prefix, then instead of doing a comparison in the critical path, it can be done in the previous cycle to save propagation delay. So that solves the prefix issues. The remaining issue with the UV parability constraint is yet unsolved. But there's a very simple solution. What about adding a transparent FIFO? This will let us decouple the alignment stage with the decode stage. So as long as the two instruction lengths are properly calculated, and there are FIFO entries, then we can at least always push two aligned instructions out of the front end each cycle. This essentially makes the UV parability issue a back end problem. And with that, we have all of the building blocks that were used in the Pentium MMX front end. Here's a diagram of the Pentium MMX from a 1997 paper, which shows the new pipeline layout and the blocks that we just discussed. I wanted to show the original diagram to tie it all together. A few features to point out. The first feature is that an extra pipeline stage was added. This new stage is named Fetch, which is used to perform the length calculation. The original Pentium called the traditional Fetch stage, Prefetch, which is the same in this diagram. The other stages are identical to the original Pentium. The second new feature is the transparent FIFO added between the Fetch and D1 stages. Other than those features, the only added feature is the MMX unit marked as M-unit, but that will not be discussed further in this video. This diagram is a little misleading on where things line up though, so let's look at a better one. While working on this video, I realized that how I thought the length decoding worked was contrary to Intel's official manual. I also discovered a patent that described a method that would be correct with the wording Intel used. The two possible options that I am aware of are shown here. 
The first option was the one I thought was used, where the parallel byte decoding was performed during the prefetch stage within the cache read data path. This would limit the possible complexity of the predecoder, reducing its accuracy, essentially trading clock speed for length decoding accuracy. Then the parallel predecode data would be stored in the prefetch buffer during a fetch and could be accumulated and aligned in the newly added fetch stage. Then the split and aligned instructions would be written into the transparent FIFO or instruction queue to be decoded in the following cycle by the D1 stage. The Intel manual, however, states that length decoding is done in the fetch stage, which could make sense if the cache data path could not support the additional predecoding delay. This would be option 2, where the predecoder is instead moved to the fetch stage and can be combined with a length accumulator to fully predecode the buffer. Essentially, on a cold fill of the prefetch buffer, there is no predecoding information, and thus there is an alignment restriction of only one simple instruction that cycle. The following cycle, however, the prefetch buffer will have been filled with the newly computed prefix information and can therefore proceed to decode up to two instructions per cycle. Furthermore, if the prefetch buffer is banked, it becomes possible to keep the predecoder in the fetch stage ahead of the aligner preventing further penalties. During a branch, however, the predecode data needs to be flushed, incurring an extra cycle of delay. In both cases, prefixes are decoded and accumulated in the fetch stage before being written to the instruction queue FIFO. Which of the two options, or if something completely different was implemented, is unclear. There are other possible configurations here as well, but those would also conflict with the Intel manual, but they may be more suitable for a refreshed implementation targeting an FPGA, for example. For simplicity, let's assume that option 1 was used since you could move a few components around in option 1 to produce option 2, and I doubt option 2 would fit in a single diagram. As a reminder, this is the previous diagram of the original Pentium front end. Here, the length decoding, alignment, prefix accumulation, and pairing checks were tightly coupled in the decode 1 stage. And this is one of the options for what the Pentium MMX front end looked like. The new length control signals are shown in blue, mostly to make the diagram easier to read. The first thing to note is the change in instruction stages. Most of the circuitry that was in the decode 1 stage of the original Pentium has been placed in a new stage called fetch. This pushes the decode 1 stage later in the pipeline. Next, the prefetch buffers and instruction cache link have changed. Both have been reduced from 32 bytes down to 16 bytes. To compensate, however, the prefetch buffer has gained an extra two banks to allow for up to four concurrent instruction streams. Two prefetch buffers make sense to mitigate branch misprediction but the additional buffers are meant to provide the functionality of a branch target cache. This would be useful for near-function calls, where the four buffers can act as a four-level return stack. In practice though, it's not clear if the performance improvement was significant, considering that no future x86 processor utilized this prefetch buffer ping-pong approach. An alternative use case, which might make more sense considering later architectures, is to treat the four buffers like two instruction stream buffers that each themselves are dual-buffered. That isn't mentioned in any of the Intel manuals, but it would simplify the logic necessary for partial buffer updates. As previously stated, a series of parallel length predecoders is included between the instruction cache and the prefetch buffers. These were likely logic array based and applied a heuristic to accurately calculate the length of the most common instructions. Any incorrect approximations would be later corrected by a full length calculation in the fetch stage. As a reminder, these predecoders may have been in the fetch stage, but delayed by one cycle. That would be possible, since they do not rely on the decode program counter to do their length calculations. Directly following the output of the prefetch buffers is the length accumulator. This would utilize fast carry chains to compute the two length rotation values pointed to by the decode program counter. This significantly shortens the length calculation that caused the main propagation delay issue from sequential length calculation. The length accumulator would then drive the two rotators, one for each pipeline. For instructions longer than seven bytes, the rotators can be set to a join, aligning a single 14-byte instruction for that cycle. The rotators then feed directly into the U and V prefix decoders and accumulators, which allow for prefix elimination in the fetch stage. Instead of sending the prefix bytes directly into the decode 1 stage, they can instead set state flags for each instruction, which essentially performs a type of compression that's easier for the decode 1 stage decoders to utilize. Both U and V prefix accumulators go directly into the instruction queue FIFO, allowing for up to two instructions to be pushed to the FIFO per cycle, regardless of the pairability. The pair checking could then be done in the decode 1 stage, decoupling it from the instruction fetch part of the front end. This is why I had previously mentioned that one could consider the decoder of the Pentium MMX to be partially in the processor's back end. In parallel to the prefix decoders, we now have two full-length calculators, which can be used to verify a correct approximation by the predecoder and to fix any incorrect length computations. The full-length calculators then go into the length checker and FIFO control block, which is responsible for verifying that the approximated lengths are correct, and if not, choosing the correct length to advance the decode program counter. If the U-length approximation was incorrect, 
then the next program decode PC would select the U-Link calculator's result, otherwise the V-Link calculator's result would be used. This change to utilizing an instruction queue between the fetch and decode stages provides more benefit than might first be apparent. Many of the x86 instructions took several cycles to execute in the Pentium MMX. This is because a given x86 instruction is broken up into a set of micro-operations. While this was likely done using a VLIW control word, you can still think of the two halves of the control word as micro-operations. Consider the example of a memory memory add instruction. The x86 mnemonic is above, followed by the set of risk-like micro-operations. The single x86 instruction translates into a load, ALU operation, and a store. Both the Pentium and Pentium MMX executed these micro-operations, and would therefore require three cycles to execute the given instruction. In other words, the execute and write-back stages would be occupied for three consecutive cycles. On the original Pentium, the front-end fetch would be stalled for two of those cycles, since the back-end was still busy. This means not only could it not correct an incorrect length guess, it also couldn't spend the time accumulating prefixes. The Pentium MMX, on the other hand, due to the FIFO, could continue to align and accumulate prefixes while the backend was busy, provided that there were sufficient FIFO entries available. This is even more significant, considering that prefix bytes do not take up FIFO entries with the Pentium MMX. Given that most x86 instructions do require more than one cycle to execute, using a FIFO to divide both sections could easily make up for simpler guesses made by the predecoder. If you think about it, this means that it really only needs to get the register register instruction lengths right, since those are the only instructions that can take one cycle to execute, which greatly simplifies the predecoding logic necessary. Furthermore, the instruction queue FIFO had the added benefit of breaking up the stall domains. As anyone who has ever implemented a processor in hardware and analyzed the critical paths knows, the stall signal tends to be the biggest offender for propagation delay. This is because the entire pipeline needs to stall if any one point requires additional cycles. The result being that the stall of every stage depends on the stall condition logic of every other stage, combined. A common solution to this problem is to introduce skid buffers. These allow you to decouple the stall logic to act in the following cycle, and thus reduces the critical path. The FIFO here acts as an active skid buffer as opposed to a reactionary one. The previously referenced Pentium MMX paper explains the reasoning for including the FIFO in not so many words, but essentially it was to reduce the critical path caused by the pipeline stall logic. It just so happens to have many other benefits as well. So now if we go back to the list of optimization methods, you can see that most of them were applied in this new front-end implementation. Pre-computation is used by the pre-decoder. Earlier computation is used by moving the prefix accumulation earlier in the pipeline. Parallel computation is used in the parallel full-length calculators and the parallel pre-decoders. An approximate computation is used in the pre-decoder combined with the length accumulator. Notice how these methods were applied in a different way from the original Pentium, further increasing the front-end performance. Anyway, this was only the beginning of increasing x86 front-end complexity. In the next part, we will look at the AMD K6 and the Intel P6 front-ends, which took a similar yet different approach to the Pentium MMX. Until next time, thanks for watching.